It's a good morning to you. Welcome to Asake Online. My name is Zanzer and this is the Breakfast uh, Club, a show where we talk about different things that are happening in our communities, uh, interesting stories and uh, yeah, news, politics and everything. And uh, this week is special to me and to the people of Matebeleland because we are, uh, I can't say celebrating, but uh, we are commemorating uh, the week, 20 January, that's the, the, the day the 5th Brigade was uh, deployed in Matebeleland. So this week we've been uh, touching around the issues of Bukura Wundi. And also what is interesting about this week is that uh, uh, we we know that um, the president uh, we hear is going to be coming to Bulawayo to meet the chiefs so that they can discuss um, the issue of Gukura Wundi and how it can be solved. Uh, we know there's the chief's initiatives that is uh, going on. There have been lots of reservations about the issue uh, from uh, civil society and the uh, communities, but anyway, uh, the chiefs are going to be going to the communities and talking uh, to people. But today I have an, in uh, let me say a very interesting guest, a special guest to me. Uh, he is uh, Professor Stanford Mukasa. He's a retired uh, uh, journalism professor but more importantly, is the former news editor of Chronicle. He was the news editor at the height of Gukura from 1982 uh, to 1985. And I'm sure he would have joined the Chronicle a bit earlier. So when everything started, he was there. So I'm talking to, this is the typical example of hearing from the horse's mouth. Professor, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Zendele. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm very much privileged to to talk to you and uh, for allowing uh, our audience to to learn from you. Maybe to start, which year did you join the Chronicle? I joined the Chronicle in 1981 after I had graduated from Ohio University in the United States with a Master of Science degree in uh, journalism. I was initially recruited to work for the Sunday Mail by Willy Musarurwa, who was the editor of the Sunday Mail at the time. And uh, so when I came to the newly independent Zimbabwe, my plan really was to cover the rural areas, rural development. I wanted to see how people in rural areas were benefiting from Zimbabwe's independence. Uh, there had been many promises that uh, there would be major improvement, improvements in uh, rural development. So, um, and Mr. Musarurwa had a plan to develop a rural development desk. And I was going to be in charge of that. And he was going to give me about two or three journalists uh, to, work around, to work with. And... Um, we would be traveling around the entire uh, country, talking to people in rural areas now that in, uh, Zimbabwe was independent. So when I arrived in um, Harare, that was April, 1981, um, there was an SOS to the Herald from the Chronicle that the Chronicle had a serious shortage of journalists. Most white reporters who were a carryover from the Rhodesian days had resigned, especially after a black editor, Mr. Tommy Sitole, had been appointed. They just didn't like to serve under a black editor. So they resigned in masse, leaving in just a handful of black journalists so the managing editor of the state media, Zimbabwe newspapers, um, told me to go to the Chronicle and not serve, uh, and that created some um, uh, disaffection between Mr. Musarulwa and uh, the managing editor. But I was simply told, you have arrived in good time, uh, don't waste any time, take your train, take the train and go to Bulawayo. That's how I went. To Bulawayo. Um, so had you been to Bulawayo before? Uh, the... Yes, I was born in Bulawayo, by the way. Um, oh. but, uh, uh, my mother was, uh, may her soul rest in peace, she was she, she, she was in the middle uh, from Inyati. My father was Shona from Murewa. 
Uh, so I I was very familiar with the Bulawayo um, and uh, I speak Ndebele very well, which was an advantage during the Gugura Wundi uh, as we were talking to people in the local areas. Um, there were a lot more forthcoming when you spoke to them in their language. Uh, so uh, at that time I became a senior journalist. The news editor that at the time was a British guy um, and um, he had his own way of journalism. I had my own way of journalism and uh, you know, I've been trained here in America where journalism is collecting facts um, and uh, publishing them uh, objectively and fairly without fear or favor. That was my training, that was my grounding. For a state newspaper, uh, which took its orders from uh, uh, from the Ministry of Information. Um, my first experience with the Chronicle uh, during those days was um, the Chronicle was in a rather unique situation. Uh, we were supposed to publish information that enhanced the image of Zanu in Matebeleland uh, and sort of. Um, played down Joshua Nkomo and Zappo. They had won the Matebele and the Zanu had lost. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Zappo was uh, very popular. In fact, during the first, uh, the next election, Zappo won all the 15 seats. Uh, the first, um, the first election for the black mayor of uh, Bulawayo in 1981, uh, Zapu won all the council seats. Um, Zanu was humiliated. And uh, for a few days, he, we did not know whether we should publish that Zapu had won. Uh, that would go against the grain of um, the policies that came from Marani. But the economics of the Chronicle um, put some pressures on the Chronicle. If you had a picture of Joshua Nkomo on the front page, the paper would sell out within hours. That was what the Chronicle needed to do to increase its uh, circulation. Its circulation was based on Zappu supporters. So the Chronicle had no choice but to publish. If they published a picture, a story of Mugabe on the front page, nobody bought the Chronicle. And so we had this, you know, this dilemma. Yeah. Um, and uh, for economic reasons, the Chronicle had to publish stories about Joshua Nkomo. Um, but then that brought about a conflict with the ZANU, um, you know, chiefs in, in, in Harare. They felt that the Chronicle was, um, was not following the orders from Harare, you know. Um, but fortunately, at that time, uh, Mr. Stolle was a very determined person. Um, he was a ZANU PF member, 100%. But he also recognized the economics of uh, journalism publishing in Matebele. Um, and um, he tried to balance those two things. And there, there were times he actually published information that ZANU did not approve. I don't know what they said to him. I don't know how he responded, but uh, we survived. We were able to uh, to live on. Now, uh, the that, that's how, that was my baptism of fire <laughs> when yeah. I became yeah. a journalist for the Chronicle. Yes, yeah. yes. So, at what so, point I, you I, think my very first on. aside? Uh, okay. Yes, I'm saying. Okay. At what point do you say ah, things are not going, and or at what is, is we are expecting? Uh, almost immediately, almost immediately. But at that point, I did not have any ambitions to go anywhere else. Um, the opportunity, the, there were no independent uh, publications at the time. Uh, and uh, you just had to go with the state media. Uh, but uh, at the Chronicle, we simply felt and uh, this was a, a policy that was also adopted by um, uh, Mr. Mr. Sitole, uh, but is even more by Godfrey Nyarota, who became editor later on. 
that we just have to publish what is out there. If we get information about something that has happened, if it is newsworthy, we should go ahead and publish that. Um, however, uh, there was tremendous pressure. We had to give a disproportionate coverage to ZANU-PF. Uh, and one example was the election of the first black mayor for Blawayo. Uh, he won and all the council seats were won by Zabu. So the editorial dilemma now was, do we publish that? In fact, I'm the one who wrote that story. Yeah. And uh, uh, because it was a very significant development, um, I wrote the story, I, I, I covered it, and I interviewed some of the newly elected councillors. Um, and I also published a speech from Joshua Nkomo. Uh, but the editor, I think he thought this was too hot <laughs> to handle by himself. So that story was actually held for several And people now were beginning to wonder, how come you are not covering? How come you are not publishing this historical moment in the history? Of, um, fortunately, some reporter asked Mugabe, uh, he was prime minister at that time in Harare, um, why is the Chronicle not publishing the elections of the first, <laughs> you know, um, Black Mayor? Yeah. And, 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 and in, in, the first elections under uh, uh, after in, during independence, uh, is it because Zanu won, Zapu won, and Zanu lost? And Mugabe's response was simply, "Well, if Zapu won, well, the media should give coverage to that. We have no objection to that. All we know is Zanu rules the country. So if they won Bulawayo, well, good for them. I don't see why the media. Once he said that." <laughs> we splashed in the front page of the Chronicle with all the news of the ZANU uh, victory. Um, and uh, that, to some extent, saved us the embarrassment because there was going to be a massive boycott of the Chronicle if we didn't publish the fact that, uh, 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 you know, the ZAPU member, I think it was nice on something like that, was yeah. had been elected the first black mayor. Um, I felt uncomfortable myself um, because I felt this should have been published. Um, and there were many other stories that appeared to favor Zappu, or that favored Zappu, some of which I published. Um, but the, some of them were held back, not because they were not newsworthy, but simply because they upstaged Zanu. Um, but there was this continuing dilemma. The Chronicle was running at a loss it had to rely on the Herald to support it. And uh, we were under constant pressure to improve, increase the circulation. But the only way you could increase the circulation in the Zappu territory was to cover news about Zappu. Prominently. So we, we, been, we were between a hard rock and a, a, a hard surface. Yeah, something like that, something like that. You see, that was the first big dilemma I faced. And coming from, you know, my training had been, uh, well, my first training was at the University of Nairobi, but most of my training in journalism was in the United States. Um, and I came back with this no-nonsense approach to covering in, in news events. If an event was newsworthy, that was my only standard. If it was newsworthy, I don't know who was affected or who was, I didn't care about that. Um, if it was newsworthy, it must be covered. So uh, around about that time, uh, you have in the uh, Entumbane battles. How do you cover that? Yeah, Entumbane happened before I came. Because Entumbane, I think, happened in 1980. Uh, yeah, I, by the time I arrived, that was over. But there were some um, commission hearings about what had happened in yes, Entumbane. Yes. Um, my experience was the Gukura Wundi. Uh, I had just been um, promoted to news editor. My role as the news editor was to look at what was happening um, around the region. We shared Zimbabwe, the Chronicle and uh, the Herald shared 
areas of coverage in Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe was divided diagonally from Binga in the Northwest to Chipinga in the Southeast. Any area west of Binga to Chipinga uh, was covered by the Chronicle. So practically anywhere. So we were responsible for Midlands, Mashingo, Matebele in South and Matebele in the North. So my role as the news editor would be to look at what was happening in all of those areas and where I could deploy my journalists. I had about uh, 10 journalists that worked under me. Um, so on this particular day, um, I had already assigned the stories to my reporters. And then at about uh, noon, uh, my uncle, uh, Reverend Mukasa, who was a Methodist minister, and in charge of the Methodist Community Center in Makokoba, uh, just called me and said, hey, I think there's something happening. And I said, what? Um, apparently, um, many people were arriving at that center and seeking asylum, you know? And then he said, there are many people who are coming here. Uh, and then I said, where are they coming from? Uh, he said, some of them say they were coming from Tabayez and Duna and all those areas. And then as the day went on, we began to receive even more disturbing re reports. And that's where I discovered that the 5th Brigade, which was based in Gueru, had been deployed at Incisa. Now, Incisa is in the border area between Midlands and Matebeleland. They were brought from, uh, uh, from Gueru and deployed in Incisa. Now, there are some people who have argued that the Gukura Hundi was not a genocide. I have argued that the manner in which the 5th Brigade was deployed, they didn't start from the Midlands. They drove quietly until they got to the border. Uh, and it was there they were deployed. And their orders, um, I heard about these orders from the commander of the 5th Brigade himself, Perens Shiri. Um, he was a kind of a funny guy uh, because um, we often met because we were from the state media. So he just regarded us as part of the government. So he was free to talk to us. Uh, and his mission, he gave us his mission and he spoke in Shona. And this is exactly what he said. I wrote this down and it's still in my notes. In Shona, Perez Shiri, the commander of the 5th Brigade, said, Chisango Changu, Chemate Beleland, Nagachipua, na Prime Minister Gutindimbo Shereketa. I want to repeat that. Chisango Changu Chemate Beleland. He didn't say Midlands or Mate. He said Chemate Beleland. Ndagachipua na Prime Minister Kuti Dimbo Shereketa. Think about that word, Kushereketa. Kushereketa, what does it mean? In Shona, Kushereketa means to be naughty. Yeah. But later on, he, he did say he was told by the prime minister, do whatever you wanna do. It was not just a question of um, dislodging the dissidents. No. It was a question of uh, neutralizing ZAPU influence and one way of neutralizing ZAPU influence was by killing the people of Matebeleland so that they would have no faith, no confidence in ZAPU. So it was an open check? Yes. Yes, and uh, he and and another thing, because my sources of information not only came from the people who were victims or their relatives or my uncle, they also came from government officials. 
government officials, especially CIO, you know, spoke openly in front of us because we were part of, the, they, they regarded us as part of the, the, the state media. They did not know that I was different. I was, you know, when I got home, I took copious notes about what was happening. And that was the first policy. And, and then Chine, um, uh, Shiri, uh, he was based at one brigade uh, at Brady Barracks. Just, I don't know whether they still call it Brady Barracks. Yeah, he's it's a brigade, but there's now a new name, uh, whether yeah. it's Lookout Masuk or whatever, but people know it as Brady Barracks. So the 5th Brigade was based at Brady Barracks. But Brady Barracks was also the headquarters of one brigade, which was led by Chinenge, who is now Chiwengo. Now, one would think, well, what's wrong with that? They are both military formations, right? No, Shiri said he took no orders from anybody but the prime minister himself. He was under he was not accountable to anybody. Now, in terms of military policy, any military operations in Matebeleland were supposed to be under Chinenge. Shiri was supposed to report it to Chinenge, but he didn't. He was his own man. And he used the, some of the resources of the fifth of, of one brigade. Um, he could commandeer any resource of the one brigade without explaining to Chinenge. And, um, you know, Chinenge in those days did not favor Gukura Wundi, uh, primarily for the reason that it was being done by a military formation uh, in a territory where he was um, in charge in terms of military doctrine, in terms of the defense ministry policies. And there was a constant clash. And to give you one example of where that clash occurred, um, we, as news editor of the Chronicle, I had asked the Ministry of Defense to allow us uh, to visit there was a special task force that had been set up and it was based in Cholocho. And um, I had asked the public relations office of the army to allow me to send reporters or even me to go to Cholocho to observe the military operations, you know, how they were um, interacting with the local population and the community leaders and all of that. Uh, I think Colonel Dyke, a former uh, uh, Rhodesian, I think he was in charge of that special task force. Um, it took a long time, but eventually we were allowed. But the way that happened was um, we were to be under the orders of the Ministry of In Department of Information. And the Webster Shamu was in charge of that visit by journalists to uh, Cholocho. Um, well, Webster Shamu created his own problems because um, when he arrived in Bulawayo and when we got into a convoy to Cholocho, he was carrying an AK rifle. And, and he was million. saying, well, yeah, yes, he was carrying something that was a no, no. <laughs> I could have been missed. But he said, well, I'm from the prime minister's office. And he was carrying one. And whenever he walked around, he was carrying it. And he had a pistol tucked in his belt. And uh, he was very bossy. Well, our, our, our convoy started off from Bulawayo on our way to Cholocho. We came to the first um, military checkpoint. This was now of the of the task force. The task fifth brigade was not part of the task force. Yeah, because the task force. We came to the first military checkpoint, and uh, Web Shamu gets out of his car. His car was in front. He gets out of the and uh, he was holding that AK rifle, 
And uh, he tells the uh, the soldiers who were mining that uh, that uh, that place, um, you know, he was asking questions. He was saying, "Well, I'm from the prime minister's office, and I want to know how you are, you know, doing and so on." And the leader of that um, of, of that task force manning that checkpoint, he pointed a finger at Webster Shamu and said, drop that gun or we'll shoot you right away. I mean, he was so humbled. I mean, he is a guy who was very bossy, <laughs> who thought he, he, he said he had a direct connection with the prime minister. Yeah. And he's being told, you drop that gun or else we're going to shoot you right away. Uh, he had to take that gun back to the car. And he was told, if we see you carrying that gun again, you will be in trouble. The guy was humbled, you know. Um, and and it can, you, you can see here the, the kind of um, uh, conflicts that sometimes arose. So we went to uh, Cholocho. And um, the army, the army task force, uh, they were very nice to us. You know, they would invite us. Would you like to see our, um, you know, parachute drop? Would you like to see us practicing? Um, but you know, the problem was what the Shamu say, no, 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 that's a, that's a secret. Then we say, how can you say it's a secret? The, these are the army guys who are saying, will you come and cover this event? And you're saying, you cannot cover that. What, what does he know about the army to tell you that is a secret? Oh gosh, he, you know, he was very pompous. He had an inflated ego. You know, he thought he was close to the prime minister. And um, anything he said, he represented what the prime minister had said. That was Mugabe at that time, he was prime minister. During, as we were going to, 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 to Cholocho, uh, there, was, there were some people who were drilling a borehole for a white farmer. And he stopped the convoy. Um, well, there were some army people there who were protecting, um, you know, at that time, you know, <laughs> you know, it's strange now, but white farmers were actually prepared, uh, protected by the army. Yeah, yeah. So there were some army guys there who were protecting um, this borehole drilling. And the website Shamu stops the, the convoy and he says, uh, Let's go to these guys who were drilling the borehole. And um, they, then he told them, uh, tell them that we are very happy the government is doing this to the people of Matebelen. Well, uh, those guys who were drilling could not speak Shona. They could only speak Ndebele. So they said, well, is there anybody among the journalists who can speak Ndebele? <laughs> Everyone pointed at me. <laughs> so I was supposed to translate. I refused. You know, I said, no, I cannot. I can't. Um, I, my orders from my editor, those were not my orders from my editor. You know, I, I cannot do that. So he wanted the, these people to say that uh, they are happy that the developers are being persecuted. Yes. Yeah. That was part of his very cheap propaganda. And the worst thing that he did at that time, he took some money from his pocket and offered them to the soldiers and said, okay, here's money, hand it to these people. And uh, you reporters, you must run, you must say that the army are not, uh, you know, causing problems, but the army are actually helping. They have been giving Here money. are some soldiers who are giving money to the local population. And the soldier, they refused. He said, um, that's not part of my command structure. I don't have orders. I don't have uh, orders to receive money and give them. You know, he kept on being put down. He kept on being, uh, you know, humiliated. And uh, when we got to Cholocho, you know, he kept on turning down all these invitations. And he just told us, well, you will write what I tell you, you know. Uh, so uh, one one thing that he did, I don't know who else was involved in this decision. Um, we, were, we were supposed to write an editorial uh, comment, the journalists who were there. 
and that that editorial would be read on uh, the broadcast media. Yeah, it would be published in the Chronicle, and the Herald, and the Sunday Mail, and all of that. Well, I refused to be part of that. I said, um, at the Chronicle, it's only the editor who writes editorials. And I don't have any authority from the editor to write a comment, you know? Um, you know, I think they began, they, they started to suspect me because I, I really wanted to accept my journalistic independence. I did not want to be part of the Department of Information propaganda plans. I refused to translate to talk in Debele uh, something that was false. And um, the, at this time, to me, I thought, you know, writing stories about the army in action, these parachute drops, something that we've been invited by the army. I thought that was good news. I thought that was something that the people needed to know about what the army was doing. Um, and then what to me was the last straw that broke the camel's back was the army commander. I think that was Colonel Dyke. He invited the community leaders. Uh, he wanted to talk to them. Uh, and we were also invited to cover that event. Web Shamu refused. He said, no, you can't cover it. You know, and uh, there were some negotiations then he ultimately agreed and he said, well, yeah, you can cover it, but don't take notes. <laughs> don't videotape the recording. Just sit there and listen. Don't write anything. To me, that was the last straw that broke the camel's back. I called the Chronicle and I said, please send me a driver and a car uh, to take me. And uh, in a matter of uh, three to four hours, uh, the Chronicle sent a driver and a car. I only told my fellow journalists that I'm leaving. I can't take this anymore. You know, um, I got into the car, I left. Many journalists were very apprehensive about that. And they said, well, you can't do that. Then I said, well, watch me. Then I went. And then I was gone. And uh, here I am in my apartment and I get a telephone call. I think it must have been about 3 a.m. or so uh, from Sitole, the editor. And uh, he said, well, the CIO phoned me and said, uh, you ran away because they suspect they were going to show uh, the journalists some dissidents that they had <laughs> captured. And they suspected that uh, uh, the dissidents might identify me as uh, you know well, someone who was working with them. And that's why I ran away. Well, I told the story, the whole story, you know, and um, fortunately, the story was very understanding as well. You know, he, um, uh, you know, in all fairness, Stolle was a, a rational person. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I was recruited, when I was sent to, 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 to the Chronicle, I, I, the first time I got to the Chronicle building, I went to his office and I spent an hour with him. And uh, one thing he told me was, um, we re you know, he looked at my credentials. I had a master of science in journalism and communication, you know? Uh, and uh, he said, well, you know, I am not a journalist by tradition and uh, we look forward to you. I look forward to your contributions and your advice and your expertise and professionalism, uh, you know, in writing the stories. And uh, it was for this reason that uh, what we call the heavy stuff, I'm the one who covered it. Yeah. I did not yeah. sign voters to cover those things. Um, for example, in one situation uh, where um, at the height of the dissident, uh, the so-called dissident conflict, uh, Como was allowed to address a rally in, um, where was it now, in Kai. So they took him to Nkai. Um, originally, the reporters were not allowed to go there. They wanted, they wanted Como to address the people uh, to stop supporting dissidents. That was, that was his mission. 
So the CIO had gathered all the people, in, as many people in the area as possible. And then Como was ready to... At that moment, Como said, I'm not going to speak unless there's a reporter from the Chronicle. <laughs> and he mentioned specifically my name. <laughs> 